Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Forum, where teachers from all schools of Buddhism offer their perspectives on the Dharma and its application in modern times, especially for LGBTQI audiences. These talks are offered freely to the world and made possible by appreciative listeners. If you would like to support our efforts to share the Dharma with underserved audiences, please visit gaybuddhist.org. There you can donate, find a list of upcoming speakers, or enjoy many hundreds of these recorded talks dating back to 1996. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Today, our teacher is Ryuko Laura Burgess, a lay and trusted Dharma teacher in the Soto Zen tradition. She teaches classes, lectures, and leads retreats in Northern California. A teacher of children for 35 years, she now mentors aspiring teachers. Laura co-founded the Sangha and Recovery Program at the San Francisco Zen Center and is the abiding teacher at Lennox House Meditation Group in Oakland. Shambhala Publishers will be offering two of her Buddhist children's books this year. Um, I hope, uh, and a collection of Jataka tales reimagined for today's readers and a book about Zen Buddhism for kids. Laura's currently working on a book about Zen Buddhism, Buddhism for adults. Um, Laura, are you able to unmute? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that introduction, Grisha. I'm, I'm always so happy to be with your Sangha. I'd, I'd much rather be there in person, but I'm very grateful for Zoom. Uh, I don't know if you've heard this statistic, but uh, one in a hundred seniors in our country have died of COVID. And having celebrated my 72nd birthday in December, I, I continue to be cautious, you know, about the a virus. And I hope you're all taking care of yourselves and that your loved ones are well, too. The Buddha said, I teach about suffering and about an end to suffering. And having studied Buddhism for many years, I, I'm so impressed with how he penetrated 2,500 years ago the all-too-human ways that we cause suffering to ourself and others, and, uh, and that he was able to offer antidotes to our greed, our hatred, and our delusion you know, what we, what we call in Buddhism the three poisons. Buddhist teachings were transmitted orally for about 400 years after his life, and they were first written down by monks in Sri Lanka. And I know that humans have a great capacity for memorization, uh, which we've largely abandoned. We don't even need to memorize phone numbers anymore. But when I was teaching third grade, by the end of the year, my students, each of them knew about a, an hour's worth of poetry by heart. I so wanted those eight-year-olds to understand that language can move us, that it can make us laugh, it can make us cry, it can inform us, and that when we memorize, uh, when we memorize words, they become a part of us. Uh, here's a poem by X.J. Kennedy that I taught my kids. It's kind of long, but bear with me. Wouldn't you love to have lasagna any old time the mood was on you? That's it. Uh, so you can memorize that poem with me right now if you'll repeat after me. Wouldn't you love to have lasagna any old time the mood was on you? See, it's easy. <laughs> uh when we take words into our minds and hearts, they become a part of us. And I think this is why it's so helpful for us to choose some Buddhist phrases or chants to memorize. And this is a wonderful way for us to align ourselves with Buddhist teachings and make a living vow. You know, vow is related to the word voice or vocal or vowel. And uh, when we say things out loud, uh, they become a part of us. One of the, Buddha, the ways the Buddhist history was survived was because his teachings were organized into the lists you're very familiar with, the Four Noble Truths, the Noble Eightfold Path, the Ten Precepts. And today I'd like to explore with you the Four Brahma Viharas. 
I thought this might be a refreshing way to start the year. These are also known as the four divine abodes or the four heavenly abodes, the four immeasurables. And Pema Children calls the four Brahma Viharas four kinds of happiness. If we want to take, turn away from these three poisons of greed, hatred, and delusion, it's important that we train ourselves to turn in the direction of these healing states of mind. I'm going to talk about each of them individually, but I'd like to start just to tell you what they are. And other people may have spoken about these. If so, I think they bear a review. <clears throat> Loving kindness. In Pali, the uh, language that the Buddha spoke, loving kindness is metta. Compassion, or karuna. Sympathetic joy, mudita. And finally, uh, equanimity, upekka. I can remember when I was 18 years old, I was walking across the campus at San Francisco State, And I was approached by a social science major with a clipboard and she, she stopped me and asked me, what did I want out of life? And without skipping a beat or giving it much thought, I said equanimity. Little did I know that in order to find that elusive equanimity, I would later need to arrest my alcoholism through the work of recovery, and find and practice Buddha's middle way. We all know the story of Buddha and that at first he lived a very self-indulgent life in his family and later sought very extreme ascetic practices. And he came to the middle way, a, a way of, I would say, common sense and a heartfelt adherence to the miraculous, ordinary, everyday life. Finding recovery and practice, uh, and they didn't come up together in my life, but, but have informed my life for the, l- the last many years. They enabled me to raise a beautiful daughter and to teach third graders for 35 years. And I'm very deeply grateful that I've had to this twin, these twin paths in my life. Now, it isn't clear to me whether we attain equanimity by cultivating loving kindness and compassion and sympathetic joy, or whether these three capacities flow out of our equanimity. And I wonder if they're like a moibus strip, a kind of continuity in our lives, that they come up together and are are inextricably bound up with one another. Let's start with metta or loving kindness. This is characterized by a wholehearted friendliness towards the whole world. We're so accustomed to dividing the world up into things we like and things we don't like, and then things we don't, we feel sort of neutral towards. But I think we're largely unconscious of the fact that we're constantly doing this. We're leaning in, we're pulling back, uh, grasping what we want, turning away from what we dislike. And I think if we can keep loving kindness in mind, if we can cultivate an unlimited friendliness towards the whole world and approach the world in this way, I think of it as giving the world the benefit of the doubt uh, and just extend ourselves out to others. We will see a marvelous transformation in our lives. One way I practice this is just by thanking everyone, you know, uh, I thank the mail delivery person when I see her for her service. I thank the people in Golden Gate Park for taking care of it. Uh, yesterday, I I saw a man approaching with a, a, a beautiful golden retriever. And I've seen him before, and I smiled at him, but I never stopped and spoke with him. And, you know, I knelt down and petted his dog, and we exchanged a few words. And just that brief moment of of human interaction, especially during this time of COVID where we're so bleakly, you know, distanced from one another, uh, that kind of made my day, you know, to have that brief moment with him. And I have to say my heart sinks a little bit when I'm at the grocery store and someone is mindfully checking out and bagging someone's groceries and that person is on their cell phone. You know, it makes my heart sink a little bit. It feels so much better 
when someone is helping us to look them in the eye and, and exchange a few words and a little humanity, a little warmth with one another. Where I've spoken about our addiction to busyness in this group. And we're, we're all often so busy getting to the next thing that we don't always take care of the person who's standing right in front of us. One of my third graders, Emily, she came rushing up to me one day and said, Laura, it's so much more fun to be kind than it is to be mean. And I've always carried that around with me since she said that. Uh, there've been a lot of studies on, on brain science and on happiness. We know much more about the brain within the last 20 years than in, you know, preceding human history. And interestingly, there are certain habits uh, that both increase our brain health and aid our happiness. It's very interesting to me that these lists come up in both of those areas of study. Um, Having strong social connection with other people is the primary one. To have a social network, this is so apparent in the time of COVID, and you certainly have this in your wonderful sangha, and I I share this with my recovery community as well. Physical exercise, such a simple thing, just to take a walk around the block. And when you do that, you're seeing new things and having new experiences too. Novelty is an important part of brain health and happiness. You know, they found that just if you drive to work a different way every day, (laughs) that this will increase your sense of novelty in your life. Any time spent in nature increases our brain health, and I think it gives us a sense of perspective and a sense of our place in the universe. Just, uh, it's something living in the city we can, we can neglect. Uh, but the Gold- Golden Gate Park is just a few minutes away from any of us. And you can walk through Redwood, the Redwood Grove behind the De Young Museum anytime you want. Finding meaning and purpose in our work. And this is whether speaking of our vocation or, or volunteer work or any kind of service we might do. Finding ways to express our creativity, uh, whether that's in art or poetry or music or cooking you know, or decorating our homes. Finding ways to express our creativity increases our happiness. Also, focusing on gratitude is 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 a way to open our loving kindness towards the world. Uh, I was writing poems about what we're grateful for with my third graders. You know, what are you grateful for? And uh, one of my little boys raised his hand and said, how do you spell bioluminescence? <laughs> Um, uh, one thing about, you know, very, very often where it's recommended that we write gratitude lists. Part of this, the research on that is if you, if you force yourself to write a gratitude list every day, this, this can lead to deeply embittered res- resentment. So <laughs> be careful with your gratitude list. <clears throat> uh, but also for brain science and happiness meditation, particularly loving kindness meditation. And we're going to chant the Metta Sutta, the teaching on loving kindness, in a little while. But, you know, in Zen, we sit without any gaining idea. We just sit and follow our breath as it rises and falls, letting go of whatever images or regrets or plans um, emerge while we're sitting. We just let those go like clouds in an empty sky. But we can also practice loving kindness meditation that in our sitting, and I did this this morning while we were sitting, to choose someone you love and picture their face and just send them loving kindness. We can also do this with people we don't know. The man with the golden retriever, your mail carrier, to just open your heart and send them loving kindness like a golden thread leading from your heart out into the world. This is a way to practice with loving kindness. There's a wonderful phrase in the loving kindness meditation that I, I, I keep very close to my heart. Um, when I find myself spiraling down into negative thinking, and it's easy to go into a downward spiral when we contemplate the seemingly irrevocable divisions in our country, the painful violence around the world, 
uh, the plight of refugees, the devastating effects of global warming and of the pandemic, and those things are probably related. Um, and it's, you know, it, not that we should ignore these issues of our time and, and do what we can to alleviate them, but we can't be much help if we're constantly mired in, in fear and self-pity and alarm. So the phrase that I'm thinking of in the Metta Sutta is, may all beings be happy, may they be joyous and live in safety. I'd like you to repeat this with me. Uh, this is something, here's a party favor you can take away from this talk today. If you'll repeat this phrase with me. <clears throat> so let's just take a breath. And focus on the heart area. In fact, put your hand on your heart right now. Physically put your hand on your heart and, and repeat these phrases. May all beings be happy. May they be joyous and live in safety. When I hear a siren, when I call to mind a friend who is in distress, when I find myself indulging in negative thoughts or, or obsessive worry, um, I can call this phrase to mind. May all beings be happy. May they be joyous and live in safety. At the same time, there may be people or situations that demand caution. Uh, we have to trust our gut here. And, and one thing, they, this fascinating thing about brain science is they found we actually have neurons in our gut. You know, this sense of a gut feeling. There's a kind of wisdom in our gut. It's, it's a scientific thing. It's a physical fact. It's not just an intuition, although that's important too. Um, so we have to trust our gut here. And if something, some person or some situation is sends up red flags, we should honor our inmost wisdom. Now, if we grew up with mental illness or alcoholism, with violence, homophobia, misogyny, racism, um, violence, a sexual or physical abuse, we probably developed coping skills that protected us from harm. This was a kind of a kind of childhood street smarts, you know, where we could sense when there was going to be danger. A friend of mine mentioned that the hair on the back of her neck would stand up when she heard the ice cubes in her father's glass of alcohol and she knew to, to withdraw. She went to a friend's house or she went up in the attic. So this gut feeling can alert us to when things could become dangerous. And we may have even developed in our family of origin the magical ability to become completely invisible. This was a really important coping mechanism. But now as adults, we can make a more reasonable decision about, about when we can allow more vulnerability. As we leave behind this, the, the tight grip of self-centered fear through our practice and the greed and hate and delusion that are, are really at the heart of our human condition, we can begin to feel a new openness and loving kindness towards the whole world. Compassion is the second Brahma Vihara or Karuna in Pali. And this literally means to feel someone else's pain, to suffer with them. This isn't the same thing as, at all as feeling sorry for someone. This is recognizing our shared humanity, the human suffering that is inevitable as long as we live in a human body. You know, I think of the AIDS epidemic we, many of us went through and, and the compassion in our communities to, before the mystery of HIV was unraveled to, to be with and sit with those friends of ours who passed from this world at that time. Um, we find compassion for one another now in the midst of this epidemic when we recognize our deep interconnectedness to all beings. And of course, a sobering example of our interconnectedness is the way a pandemic can spread so quickly around the world from one person to another. It seems like every day, um, well, every day, thousands of people are dying. 
we can have compassion for one another because we're all in this boat together. There's a wonderful quote from Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. If we could but read the secret history of our enemy, we would find there suffering and sorrow enough to disarm all hostility. <clears throat> if we could read the secret history of our enemy, our enemy, we could find there suffering and sorrow enough to disarm all hostility. This may be the real test to extend compassion to everyone without exception, even those with whom we're, we might be in conflict or not be so fond of. Now, sympathetic joy, compassion is the ability to share in the sorrows of others, to feel their pain. Sympathetic joy is the ability to share in their joys. This isn't always as easy as we might think. There's that wonderful German word schadenfreude, uh, which is deriving joy from the misfortunes of others. Uh, sympathetic joy is the opposite of this. When something wonderful happens to someone else, we wish them well and support them in, in their happiness. In recovery, when someone reaches a milestone, we clap and cheer for them because we're now capable of feeling sympathetic joy and our own sobriety is renewed and celebrated uh, with each day of everyone else's recovery. Can we even extend sympathetic joy to strangers or people we don't care for? In our greed, hatred, and delusion, we may secretly enjoy, you know, rejoice when someone who has wronged us suffers and we may begrudge them any kind of happiness or ease. But living in that realm of resentment and vindictiveness is not a pleasant place to be. The physical effects of holding on, you know, to resentment uh, are well known. It really only harms ourselves. I love Pema Chodron's observation. Holding a grudge is like eating rat poison and expecting the rat to die. Um, equanimity. Equanimity is simply coming back to our center. Um, if we can cultivate loving kindness, compassion, and sympathetic joy, equanimity can follow. If we cultivate equanimity... Maybe loving kindness, compassion, and sympathetic joy will arise as well. If we practice the way we did together this morning, sitting upright in this crazy world, not getting up and running away, but just literally staying in our seat, opening our heart to whatever arises within us, opening our heart to other beings, the four Brahma Viharas are well within our reach. Now, I don't offer this practice because I've mastered it. That might take many lifetimes. And as the Vipassana teacher Jack Cornfield said, if you can sit quietly with difficult news, if in financial downturns you remain perfectly calm, if you can see your neighbors travel to fantastic places without a twinge of jealousy, if you can find contentment just where you are, you are probably a dog. This is a lifetime practice, you know, not something we can conquer <laughs> in a moment. And one way to cultivate these healing states of mind is simply to call them to mind, to choose one of these qualities and allow it to come to mind as you live your everyday life. Tomorrow you might wake up and say, I'm going to keep love and kindness in my heart throughout today. And then come back to it, just the way you come back to your breath during the day. Come back to loving kindness and offer that face to the world. If you turn toward loving kindness uh, during the day, you might let someone get ahead of you in line or in traffic. You might smile at a stranger or or act on an impulsive uh, uh, an impulse towards generosity. You might tell your partner how much you appreciate them. You know, we can tend to take those people we love so much for granted. You might send a loving note to a friend who's far away. Uh, so, Grisha, I'd like to share now with the group the Metta Sutta, the teaching on loving kindness. Uh, I think most of you probably have experienced chanting, but I'll just say 
The way we chant together is to find a common note. Al said the note, and and we sing that note together as we chant without inflection. Uh, when you need to take a breath, you can just drop out and then come back and join me. I'm going to begin by, um, with a bell, chanting the name of the sutra. And then as I begin to chant, please just join in with me. Metta Sutta This is what should be accomplished by the one who is wise, who seeks the good and has obtained peace. Let one be strenuous, upright and sincere, without pride, easily contented and joyous. Let one not be submerged by the things of the world. Let one not take upon oneself the burden of riches. Let one's senses be controlled. Let one be wise but not puffed up. And let one not desire great possessions even for one's family. Let one do nothing that is mean or that the wise would reprove. May all beings be happy. May they be joyous and live in safety. All living beings, whether weak or strong, in high or middle or low realms of existence, small or great, visible or invisible, near or far, born or to be born, may all beings be happy. Let no one deceive another nor despise any being in any state. Let none by anger or hatred wish harm to another, even as a mother at the risk of her life watches over and protects her only child. So with a boundless mind should one cherish all living things, suffusing love over the entire world, above, below, and all around without limit. So let one cultivate an infinite goodwill toward the whole world, standing or walking, sitting or lying down. During all one's waking hours, let one practice the way with gratitude, not holding to fixed views, endowed with insight, freed from sense appetites. One who achieves the way will be freed from the duality of birth and death. I love that sutra, and I chant it every day. And uh, this might be one of the Buddhist teachings that you might want to memorize and and chant at your home altar. So thank you so much for your kind attention. And uh, we're going to open the floor now for discussion. Hi, Laura. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, I'm Matthew. Um, I was looking forward to you uh, being with us today because I just wanted to thank you because I've gotten so much mileage out of an anecdote that you've told before. <laughs> and that's the one about the two little girls and the one asks the other, do you want to be buried or cremated? <laughs> the other one said, I don't know, surprise me. <laughs> I just wanted to say that I just finished uh, a year of this workshop through uh, Todd Wright Vinnie Ferraro with the wonderful uh, contributions of Frank Ostaseski. And, uh, and so a lot of it is kind of looking at one's attitudes about death and, and anxieties or whatever. And, um, and so for me, that little anecdote has has been like a, a kind of touchstone for me because at this point in my life, or at least right now, I'm I'm really um, I'm really quite satisfied in not knowing, mm. in kind of abiding and not knowing. So surprise me has been kind of like a little touchstone, not just about death, but but also just. Um, it just really encapsulates for me that idea of um, abiding and not knowing. 
And so I just really wanted to thank you again. Um, and you've already, you've already dropped a couple of wonderful anecdotes already <laughs> in today's session, but I just love your stories. And I know that comes a lot on your teaching experience. So thank you. Well, Matthew, thank you. That pleases me no end. Uh, there are many things I don't miss about teaching. Carpool comes to mind. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to give you uh, some new material. I ran into one of my former students It's it, in uh, Point Reyes, and she came up to me. She said, Laura, I don't know if you remember me, but I was in your class. And I said, Anna, not only do I remember you, I remember when you raised your hand and said, Laura, what happens after you die? I forget. <laughs> 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 and, and another one that I always come back to, Matthew, and this this has to do with not knowing too, which is uh, one day I uttered that cliche, "Great minds think alike." And um, Paul raised his hand and said, "No, they don't. That's what makes them great." <laughs> <laughs> so, as you can tell, I've learned a lot from my third graders. Thank you so much, Matthew. Uh, go ahead, Tom, online. Hi, Laura. Thank you so much for being with us again. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I really love what you said about <clears throat> giving the world the benefit of the doubt, mm -hmm. you know, and thanking everyone going about just having that attitude. It reminds me of um, something that Dave Rico shared either with us or in one of his books about, you know, attributing uh, or assuming the best intentions mm -hmm. of your partner or, you know, or anyone yet that you're in disagreement with at times. Um, and what I wanted to ask is, you know, I mean, it's difficult to be in the world and know what's going on and read the news or, you know, just be around things. For me, sometimes it just, um, I'm assuming the worst of intentions, you know, uh, of people in general sometimes. What would you suggest? Like, is there a practice that can maybe lift us up out of that or help us reorient? towards the positive and not assuming the worst of the world? Thank you for that question, Thomas. You know, recently I was crossing the street uh, and there was a, the car was kind of parked in the middle of the crosswalk. And so I kind of indicated to him, you know, you're parked in the crosswalk. And he yelled out the window, go back to Wisconsin. And, uh, but I, I stopped and I remembered I was a Buddhist and so I yelled back at him, I was born here, you jackass. <laughs> uh, so, you know, we're, we're not perfect, right? But um, I do think, Thomas, that this practice of keeping loving kindness in mind, you know, or, or having the word equanimity in mind, just keeping that at the forefront of our mind, that we might more often lean in that direction rather than in the direction of distrust and cynicism, you know, and I, I do think we're talking about habits of mind, right? So um, I share with you, I, I have to constantly confront my suspicions, my, my pessimism, you know, my, my lack of faith in human beings and, and turn in a different direction, you know, and I think as just as we come back to our breath again and again when we sit, if we turn in a different direction, we can change that habit of mind. But, you know, at the same time, to honor that gut feeling, if there is something that we need to be on guard about, you know, I think of practice as a way of chipping away at our armor and giving the world the benefit of the doubt. And, and maybe equanimity, part of equanimity is being very trusting and open hearted and at the same time taking care of ourselves, you know, that might be even a good definition of equanimity. So thank you so much for that question. Yeah. Hi, Chris. Good morning, and thanks, of course, for being with us today. Um, sorry, oh, sorry, we were muted, Laura. Peter was talking, and we were muted. Okay. So can you go next, Chris? One second. Go ahead, Peter. <laughs> Laura, uh, when we were chanting, there was one line that uh, I don't understand. Let one's senses be controlled. 
What does that mean? I think let one's senses be controlled is the teaching of the Buddha that in his early life he was he had every indulgence. You know, his parents protected him from from any kind of suffering. And to counteract that when he went out in the world, I mean it said that he just ate one grain of rice a day. You sometimes see pictures of the Buddha in a skeletal, you know. And so I think uh, let one's senses be controlled. It doesn't mean to shut our senses down. I don't. I don't think the Buddha taught to annihilate desire because there are wholesome desires. I think it's it's about not letting our our sensual life to enjoy our sensual life and our sexuality and our enjoyment of food. This is part of being alive, without um, letting them push us around to the extent where we're doing things that we don't feel good about. That's my understanding of let one's senses be controlled. Um, is that helpful, Peter? Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. Chris, go ahead. You can unmute. Hi. Um, I, uh, these brown Bahars, of course, I've been looking at them and looking at them, and then I look at them again a year later, and then I realize I've recited many of these chants, uh, almost mind-numbing sometimes. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> You know, I, I realize it. Well, one of the ways I'm sort of framing it now for myself is a really form of a remedy, or a form of offering me out some um, some practices for resilience or flexibility. And and I'm finding that it's not so much trying to do these, but sort of remarking when I see it in my life. Like uh, I may have an exchange, like you brought up the idea, uh, being at a store and just exchanging with someone that's, um, you know, putting groceries in a bag to, to really see that. And not only there's a certain feeling state, it's not even, it's, it's in a, a sort of a, um, um, an embodied emotion one can feel when they've had a revelation or a, or a response, or you see equanimity, like equanimity sounds kind of hard to practice. And all of a sudden you see it arise in your life mm-hmm. without even trying in a sense. And, you momentarily will see that in your life, and then you kind of move on with whatever you were doing, your work, or getting in the car, or whatever. And I'm really trying to stop and remark, or really kind of extend, or really sort of allow my, you know, Rick Hansen would say, sort of allow my 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 cells to sort of bathe in that that feeling state because I want it to rise and express itself more, and to acknowledge it. If that made any sense. I think it did. did it? Absolutely. <laughs> you know, thank you for that, Chris, because Rick Hansen he uses the word savor. You know, that, that, that when we see a beautiful sunset or we see a child take their first steps, we should savor that and let it, let it, uh, bathe in our neurons so that we can change some of these deeply held habit patterns of negativity and suspicion. We just, it's a kind of that savoring is a kind of antidote for that automatic negative thinking that's so familiar to us, you know. So thank you so much for that. It's it's being aware of it when it arises helps us uh, appreciate it and savor it. So thank you for that. Uh, let's do Jim in the room and then Bob on Zoom. Hey, that rhymes. <laughs> hey, thanks, Laura. It's always so great to hear you and see you. Well, you know, I want to. Uh, I really appreciate what you said about memorization. I had a, I had an old friend who visited her great aunt in the hospital, and the aunt, to amuse herself in a long stay, uh, started writing out all the lines of poetry that she had learned growing up. Ah. She came up with over 5,000 lines of poetry, and that this was how kids were educated in a certain, this was, they understood that this trained the brain, it shaped the brain, and we're talking about the neuroplasticity and that we're still they're still growing. And uh, Auden, um wrote an essay about a school for poets. And one of the things, they should have a garden, and they should have a pet that they had to care for, and they should memorize thousands of lines of poetry. <laughs> and um, I, I really commend you that you, you, you took your kids along and showed them the power of that. They'll never forget um, those poems. Um, I can't memorize the thing now. My brain just doesn't <laughs> hold it, but it's nice to hear that other people can. You might surprise yourself that with practice you can. 
you know, start with, wouldn't you love to have lasagna? <laughs> um, you know, uh, we, uh, we lasagna, I, lasagna. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you know the book Madeline in an old house in Paris that was covered in vines. You know, it's about a little girl who has appendicitis and then her friends go to visit her. And in the middle of the night, they're all crying because their friend got all these presents when, and she got a beautiful scar when she had appendicitis. So her friends are all crying, boo hoo, we want to have our appendix out too. So that, we memorized that whole book in third grade and one of my children got appendicitis and she was in the hospital and she had her appendix out and then I, I mean, this just gives me goosebumps even to think about it now. She sat up in bed and she recited Madeline to her nurses and it blew their minds, you know, and it made them laugh. That, that book makes you laugh, you know. Uh, so thank you for bringing that up. And, uh, uh, don't thank underestimate you. your ability to memorize things. It, it improves uh, with practice. Definitely. That's my case. That's my. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Bob. <laughs> Yes, I want to say thank you for so many of the things you said today I needed to hear again. And one of the things you said early on reminded me of a poem that I shared with some of the people in the Sangha. I often go to what I call the seventh sense, the sense of humor. I hope this poem is not considered offensive to you or anybody. In fact, it's titled An, an Ethical Group. I need my glasses. I see and I hear and I speak no evil. I carry no malice within my breast. Yet quite without wishing a man to the devil, one may be permitted to hope for the best. <laughs> so thank, thank you, you again for today. Thank you. <laughs> Laura, I'll take a turn. Um, I was, my niece is visiting from Washington, D.C., and we went to Point Reyes yesterday. And it was a spectacular day. Blue skies. We saw turkeys and elk and coyotes and beetles and dead worms. But um, I appreciate what you said about like uh, saying it out loud, like putting it to voice because um, I have such negative bias, which I think comes from my mom and her grandma. And like my mind just goes negative first. And so um, I think uh, when I said it out loud, like, oh, it's so beautiful. Oh, look at the sky. Oh, look at the ocean. Like, just stop and look and think and say it. Just saying it really, really helps, I think. And um, But then this other woman stepped up, and um, we were looking at the beautiful elk who were relaxing and chewing grass, and this woman walked past all the signs that say, don't disturb the elk, and she's got her phone out, and she's like, I'm going to take a picture and get really close. And then the elk kind of, like, looked up and got really – you know, looked like he was thinking, what are you doing? Woman? Get away from me. <laughs> and, uh, and so then my mind is like cussing her out, you know, and like grabbing her by the nape of her neck and pulling her back. You know? <laughs> so again, not the Buddhist react, not the Buddhist response we're looking for, but, um, but I didn't. So <laughs> there you go. Grisha, do you know how many times I've walked around Stow Lake and seen someone standing next to the sign that says, do not feed wildlife, feeding wildlife kills feeding bread to the ducks, you know, and I try to maintain, I, I try to maintain noble silence, but I'm not always successful. <laughs> Anyone else? Comments? Questions? Well, if not, we can wrap up and um, any final words, Laura, or are you well, yes. You know, I just want to thank you so much. I've had a lot of fun with you here today. And although I'm not with you in person, I feel deeply connected with each of you. You know what, um, Grisha, what you said about Point Reyes, which is a spiritual place for me, and we're so lucky to live within the range of the Golden Gate National Recreation Area. Um, I want to share with you a poem that I taught my third graders. It's by Edna St. Vincent Millay, and I think this is a nice way to close. I will be the gladdest thing under the sun. I will touch a hundred flowers and not pick one. I will look at cliffs and clouds with quiet eyes, watch the wind bow down the grass and the grass rise. And when the lights begin to show up from the town, I will mark which must be mine and then start down. 
Thank you again for your kind um, presence here and for everything that you all shared, even in silence. Thank you. All right. So at this point, we're just asking for announcements. Any in the room or on Zoom? From Jim, go ahead. Good morning. I'm your host. Um, there are some uh, healthy satsuma uh, filters out there and some less healthy anthropogenic pastries, but quite tasty. Uh, there's hot water for tea. And just please leave your cup in the sink and I will take care of this. I'll be going around with a dining bowl. Um, we have uh, ongoing expenses, which you can imagine. We're looking at maybe 10 to $20 a person. For people on Zoom, you can go to the GPF um, site, and at the bottom, there's a link to uh, a PayPal uh, where you can give a donation, or you can just send in a check. And we very much appreciate it. We're, we're looking at a lot of expensive new equipment um, that we bought to maintain this dual capacity. So um, feel generous to the GPF. Thank you. And um, some of us will gather at the door and go to lunch. Anyone is welcome. And I don't know who next week is. Oh, good question. Um, and Sean, while I'm looking, uh, it's Sean Fight. Uh, oops, say it again, Chris. It broke up. I'm sorry, it's Sean Fight. Um, he's spoken with us before years back. He sort of works for Spear Rock, has his own website actually. It's interesting to look at if you uh, want to check it out before he speaks next week. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, it's also on the website. Um, well, I, I, I want to say some more. Um, appreciate is just indispensable. Um, being able to do this, um, be present here and be present to the Zoom people. He's learned how to do this by teaching school kindergartners in okay. dual format. So, uh, so long for that. Um, Jeff got together a lot of this equipment. And um, George is always doing our, our sound. We're really blessed by uh, the service of our members. So I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. Yeah, and then also in the spirit of service, we if you are interested and available and have some bandwidth, um, there is a prison pen pal program through the Zen Center, um, and I'm currently the person uh, sharing the responsibility with Ray to go to the mailbox and get letters and read them and respond to them. But we have a lot more requests for pen pals than we have pen pals, and so if you um, feel like you want to do that service, then please reach out to me. Um, and I would actually like someone who, to take over the mailbox uh, maintenance and that and that program. I've been doing it for a couple of years. Thomas did it before me and trained me. So put that in your mind as something to consider for this new year and let me know if you're interested. And any other announcements? All right. Um, is Laura still here? Oh, yeah, there she is. Do you have a um, dedication merit, or you want, would you like us to use ours? Uh, I'd love to do the dedication, sure. Oh, cool. Okay. All right. So I will um, – everyone will stand up in a circle, and I'll, maybe we could um, – I don't know. Be in the circle. <laughs> All right. <here. laughs> We dedicate the merit of our practice to all beings in the ten directions, past, present, and future. May we hold in our hearts loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity as we, as we walk through this troubled world. May all beings be happy. May they be joyous and live in safety. May we be happy. May we be joyous and live in safety. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Laura. Thank you, Grisha, and everyone. everyone. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. See you next time. Thank you for listening to the Gay Buddhist Forum. If you would like to hear several new talks per month and be notified of upcoming speakers so you can participate live, please subscribe to this podcast, like us on Facebook, and join our mailing list by visiting gaybuddhist.org.